Bank Whiskey. It's not a one-off. It's a core product. So to support that, we have got a five-year supply agreement for the grain. Now that sounds an awful long time. It's not. They buy the, the seed in the spring. They plant it in the autumn. They harvest it in the winter. And it's malted the following year. So you very quickly run out of your five years, very quickly. So we have made that commitment uh, to take the, the rye from that farm to keep the supply going and always, always, always guaranteeing the provenance. Now, the rye that you will be tasting later on is not made from five rye. It takes a long time to build up a supply chain but actually it comes from where I was born and brought up eh, in the Cromarty Firth, just north of Inverness and just around eh, Roskine, some two farms that I knew very well and they were able to supply us while we then set up that supply chain with the local, with the local farm. But everything since then has been grown here in Fife and now all, also all of the barley for the, the, the rye is, is in here. When we were taking a look at rye, we just wanted to understand some of the history of rye because, you know, we're respectful of the traditions, but what was, how was rye used historically? It's always good to know where you come from because it's always a good help in sensing the direction in which you're going. So this one here is Mr. Barnard's book. This is a 1960s reprint of the Alfred Barnard book. A fine fellow, but if you're a whiskey distiller, he's a bit annoying. He'll write four pages about a distillery, but the first two is what he had for breakfast and how he got there. Uh, and I think, I don't want to know what you had for breakfast and how you got there. Tell me more about it. So you have to filter this one out quite, quite well to get to it. And actually, it's just Port Dundas distillery that he refers to as well. So it was a grain distillery in Port Dundas. And they, they did use quite a lot of rye. And it was, in fact, local Scottish rye that, that, that they were using. And again, frustratingly, he talks about malted rye and unmalted rye. Well, that really didn't help. I mean, how much of it was malted? How much? Of, how, of why did you use malted barley? No, he just dropped a wee one line at you when you had to catch it. So that was a bit frustrating for, from this particular book. But that, but very clearly, rye was used in Scotch whisky, which was really very obvious because rye loves poor quality land. And at that time, Scotland was full of poor quality land. So rye would grow very, very easily. Then we have another reference here in this one, and I, I, I have read Mr. Barnard from one end to the other. I have not read this one from one end to the other. I've, no, I did not. So this actually is the Royal Commission of 1908 to 1909, and it's only the interim report. <laughs> so to read the interim report and the final report, I think stop here. There is a history behind this which I have my suspicions about. So the story apparently goes that in London, which is what you would expect, they're all, all rascals down there, this chap went into a shop and bought Scotch whisky. He was sold Scotch whisky. He took it home and decided it wasn't Scotch whisky. So he went to the magistrate. And the magistrate went, well, I'm a man of the law. So, you know, the quality of the whiskey is neither up nor down to me. I'm a man of the law. Speaking as a man of the law, I can't help you. Because what is Scotch whiskey and what is Irish whiskey? In those days, it didn't make any difference. There was no definition. Now, that apparently is what resulted in a royal commission. Uh, something has to go on. I mean, the, ro the royal commissions don't happen just like that. So I believe there was something else in the background. Possibly it was a setup. Possibly it was. But in this book, and this is the evidence presented to the 1908, and it is verbatim. 
This is not a notebook. This is precisely what people say. There was people writing this down as people were speaking. And I think, how did you do that? It's quite, quite remarkable, I think. But in here, um, there's a, a, a gentleman uh, by the name of Mr. Ross who gave evidence to the, uh, to the Royal Commission. And he was the purchasing director, is what you would call him today, of DCL, which was the original DCL that only owned grain distilleries at the time. All the malt distilleries were owned by a separate company called Scottish Malt Distillers, and a few years later they came together and ultimately became the Diageo of today. But this chap here was responsible for the purchasing of spirit of the sorry of the grain, and in here he's talking about all the cereal that he was buying, and he makes some very interesting comments in here, and he actually says and. Um, the question is, uh, here we go. What proportion of foreign barley is used in the different distilleries? He then responded, you mean the patent stills distilleries? The answer comes back, yes. I mean, every word was written down. I, be, I bet you if somebody coughed, they would have put down <laughs> cough. Um, yes, we use entirely foreign barley. And he goes even further in here and describes it as Danube. Now that's interesting because that actually is quite important in today's environment, which actually meant actually Ukrainian barley because the Ukraine was the bread, the bread basket of Europe. So when he meant Danube, he meant that's how it actually arrived in Leith. It came on barges along the Danube River, crossed a few canals into the Rhine and then finished up in the North Sea. So it was all in there. He also then agrees that they were using a lot of rye. And a really obvious question came up into here, if I can really find it. Uh, there we go. Somebody's, somebody's been pinching this and they used it in here. Right, and, and the question, so, and he talks about the different rye and, and different cereals. And the question is, is there a very distinct difference in flavor between the two patent still whiskies, one which was made from 30% malt, 70% maize, and the other of which was being one third malt, one third rye, and one third maize? There is a difference. I do not know that there is a very noticeable difference. What a disappointment. The whiskey must have been rubbish because when you use rye, it, it, it did make a difference. But what I liked about this actually reflected something that happened here. He was then asked, well, if it does not make a difference, why do you use rye? And he came up with, because rye foamed a lot when it fermented, and most of the foam was contained a lot of yeast, in the top of the wash back, um, they would actually put what was basically an umbrella, an upturned umbrella, and the foam fell into the umbrella and they sucked it out and they harvested yeast. And the reason why they did that was it was another piece of the economy. They actually sold the yeast to the malt distillers. So why did he use rye? They used rye so they could make yeast. But that foaming characteristic was something that concerned us a lot when we were beginning to use rye here. I spoke to all my old, all my old colleagues in, uh, in Kentucky and in Alberta, and, and they, they all had one thing to say, and that was foam. Ian, it'll foam. Be careful. The distillery will fill up with foam. So we thought, okay, we, we, we got the rye, brought, got it malted, brought it in. So we put, as somebody asked the question, we, we put four mashes into one wash bag, but we've just put one, got the yeast in of it. Come back in the morning, Scott went up on top of the wash bag, opened the hatch and we've got ourselves a problem. And the problem is there was no, no foam. So we were told, watch it, the, the distillery will be full of foam and there is no foam. So we put two mashes into the next wash bag, opened the hatch, no foam. So after that, we filled the washbacks up and they never foamed. 
So we knew the variety of barley because we were trying to understand why did it not fall. So we made contact with the, the seed supplier. We've got our way all the way down the supply chain. And he said, well, I happen to be up in Glen Rothes in, in the next week because close to us here, there is a lot of research done in different varieties of grain and he was coming up to visit the area. He came to see us and we said, well, what is the variety? I would love to be a member of the committee that comes up with these variety names. It was called Magnifico. So, what a dreadful name, but they came up with it. And he, he goes in his book and he goes, oh, ah, that's a non-foaming variety. <laughs> Why did nobody tell us that? Because we made the presumption, because the book on making rye whiskey in Scotland was never written, that there is foaming varieties and non-foaming varieties. When I mean no, I mean zero foam. It doesn't foam. And maybe to a certain extent, the fact that our rye was malted, which would have broken down a lot more of the proteins, that would have even made a... It was probably a low foaming variety, but when we malted it, it became a zero foaming variety. But we knew that was magnifico. We thought, right, remember that one. He's, we thought, well, while you're here, is there other non-foaming varieties? And he gave us a name of Performa. There we go, Magnifico and Performa. Horrific names. So at the moment, uh, we are using Performa as the rye variety, which is important to us because we would find it very, very difficult here to produce our whiskey if we had foaming ryes. So that takes us back to our Fife provenance and the connection between the distiller and the farmer. So we have got a five-year deal with the farmer and we've said it will be performer and he goes, yep. So we have guaranteed to buy it from him, which gives him the security to always buy that for a particular variety of rye, always to plant it and always in the knowledge that we will always take it. Muntins will always malt it for us and we will always use it. That gives us some guarantee over the, um, over the variety, allowing us to make it. Rye has got lots of very interesting bits about it. Now, last weekend, we were in Rioja and went to there was a, an event on there that we were taking part in. We kind of secret kind of launch that we did with the rye. And we shown around the, the, the vineyard, of course, and they talked about how they sorted the actual grapes. They didn't want the green ones. And it was done by a camera and a, a gun of air. And it, it saw a green one and it, shot, and it blew a shot of air and it blew the grape off. So that's how they sorted it. Rye can be dangerous. They say that many of the witch trials in Europe weren't because there was witches, it was just that the rye bread was a little bit dangerous. And it's called ergot. Mm. If you think magic mushrooms are bad, apparently ergot is really something. With rye, when it's got ergot, it turns black. So after they harvest it and before they even dry it, guess what? It, they run it over a screen with a camera and a gun of air, and they spit out all of the black grains and to take it away. Don't ask me what they do with the black grains. I'm not going there. <laughs> Nothing to do with me, nowhere. So it was interesting how actually wine and, and, and making whiskey, there was a similarity on some really bizarre um, item, but that's how we make sure that the, that the rye is safe. But what the farm does, something even more interesting to help with the air go is that it's not 100% performer that's in the field. They mix it with 10% of another rye that will flower five days before the main variety will flower. Because it's when the, fl the flower is just about to be pollinated, that's when the ergot comes in. So if you get it pollinated really quickly, it won't get ergot. So they deliberately put in a small amount so it just flowers a few days before it and manages it out. 
So that's when the farmer manages that problem out and we then physically remove it by running it through the, the colour sort of in, in there. So that's what um, we're, we're doing with the with the, the supply chain of the malted barley, but all of the of the of the rye, but all of it is taken down to store market in England, where it's malted in a drum maltings, not a floor maltings, not a single vessel maltings, but in a drum maltings. And earlier on, I talked about how the progression of the technology where it went from fl uh, floor maltings to um, salad in boxes. The next piece of technology that came along was the drum malting. And they've been, they've been drum malting for many, many years. And it's a really perfect way of doing it, particularly in smallish batches. The drums that we have at store market will give us 28 tons of malted rye, which is precisely one load. So we always got full loads. So they, they, they'll steep it just like the barley get it wet, bring it up to 45% moisture. They will then pour it into the drum. And the drum very, very slowly rotates. You've got to actually stand beside it and take a mark on it and eventually you will see it move. And when it does that, all the grain at the bottom eventually comes to the top and runs down. So it does that in, to do precisely what the old wooden shovel would do. It basically breaks it up, gets oxygen in, gets the carbon dioxide out, and stops all of the grains growing, stops it matting. And that would then be very difficult because it would overheat then, and that's what they do. So they then rotate that drum for between four and five days. And then they kiln it, and they will kiln it in the drum. The drum will it'll just rotate slightly faster, and they will blow warm air into it. It's not peated. No, we don't peat them. That's uh, something for, a, for, for another day. I don't think it quite works in my mind, but, but, but we will see. So at Stowe Market, they will make the malted barley, the malted rye for us. They also make our malted barley, and they both come up here, and we blend them to our 5347 mix in the, um, the pre grind hopper. So the grains are milled together and they pass through the entire process together. This is why. Oh no, somebody's pinched my. The, the pinched my, 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 my barley. The, oh no, here we go. I've got some hiding in the back here. Yeah. They're easily confused. They're very <laughs> easily confused. They look really, really similar. This even looks like a six roll bar. But this is a European British two row barley. Two row barleys are actually not two row barleys, they're actually six row barleys, but they've got four guys that kind of go, nah, we'll not bother. So, they, they, you will see them hiding in it, but that's what they call a two row barley. In America and Canada, it's six row barley. In Europe, it's two row barley. It's just the agronomics. It's easier for those two barleys to grow where in those places. But in Scotland, it's almost always two row barley. Last year, we used some six row barley. Did it make a difference? Come back in a couple of years and we'll tell you whether it makes a difference or not. But this here is rye. Majority of rye grown in Scotland never gets to this stage. It never gets to it. They actually harvest it when it's green, a bit like the field, not the one nearest us, but the one behind. They will cut it when it's still green before this appears. And it will all go to feed anaerobic digestion. So it was important for us to set up the supply chain because you just can't lift the phone and can I have 500 tons of malted rye? That doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. It has to be done especially for you. So this is the rye. The farmer likes rye. It does lots of things. It's also very tall. It will grow to this height, which in Scotland scared me. 
because in Scotland two things happen simultaneously and it happens all summer. It's wet and windy all summer, which to me means it all falls over. If it falls over, it lodges and it will start to sprout and then it's, it's ruined. That won't happen to rye because the, the straw is big and heavy. Now the farmer likes that because when he cuts the grain, but through the combine harvester, they take the rye off and all the straw goes out the back of the combine harvester and they chop it. They chop it into fine bits and spread it on the field. So then when they go to plough it, they plough it in. But they don't have to do that. The, rat, the, 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 the straw itself is still usable. It's still valuable to them if they sold it as that. So they, they do like the rye. The rye is a break crop. These fields here cannot grow year after year after year of barley. They cannot. The, the soil goes wrong. You have to put in break crops like potatoes. Maybe, they, maybe they'll put in some wheat. They'll put in some barley. Rye is something that they can add into that mix and gives them the chance to bring something else into it and helps with the economics. The roots are very deep. They go down very deep and that also helps with the wind. So they've got a good structure, but it means they break up the soil and they work in, and it, and it works well for the farm. It's, and it's also a very easy crop to grow because it's a crop that used to grow on the poorest possible land. Now they're growing it on the best possible land, so nothing to hold it back. When I was talking at, uh, at least with, with my team, so maybe my team or maybe I'm set ahead, I spoke about our carbon footprint. And 55% of our carbon footprint of our whiskey comes from this. It's our malting barley. And half of that comes from the kilning of the barley, but mountains are switching to biomass, so that will begin to come down. The other half comes from the barley itself, and the overwhelming majority of that is not the farmer in his tractor driving up and down the field. That is actually one of the smallest parts of the carbon footprint. The biggest part of the carbon footprint is the fertilizer, the artificial fertilizer, the nitrogen. That comes in two parts. Making it is very, very energy intense. A lot of energy in to make the nitrogen. When they spread the nitrogen on the field, the nitrogen gets washed in, it then begins to break down and will then be released back into the atmosphere as nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide has a greenhouse gas equivalent of carbon dioxide of something like 250 times. So if you pull back a little bit on nitrous oxide, you're making a big difference. So as part of the what we're working with the local farming community here and our supply chain is how can we, not we, we're distillers, we're not. If you want to keep your head on your shoulder, never tell a farmer how to farm. It's not a good idea. So they have come up with a solution that they would like to work with. And one of which is what we call cover crops. There are some crops, they're not really crops, but they're plants, actually fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. Peas and beans and clover, they're the ones. So if you plant them, let them do their thing, and then don't plow the field. Don't plow the field. Just simply plant the seed into the cover crop. The cover crop will die off and will then provide a good blanket for the soil, keeping the water, keeping it moist. But that plant, when it was growing, grabbed the nitrogen, took it into its roots, and then released it in small little nodules on its roots. But deep. When you spray nitrogen on the field, it goes about that much into the soil. If you get a nitrogen fixing plant, it goes down. So it stays down and it releases much slower so that when the barley grows or the, or the rye grows, it goes down into the soil and gets a hold of that and it makes better use. So you had lots of gains. One, you didn't use any energy putting it there and the plant makes better use of what there is. 
So we're working there with the, with the plan to do, run some experiments. Can we get the cover across the ideal situation? Now, do we ever get there? Well, you should always try, but if you fall over, it doesn't matter. Spring barley is harvested in August and planted in April, so the field is empty. Put the cover crop in over the winter. Let it do its own thing in the winter, and then go in and do that. Whether we make that or not, I don't know. But if some of it does that, then, then we will have helped a little bit. But that's what we want to do with the Fife Farmers Group. We want to support them in, that, in those ideas and let them develop the practicalities around that. We guaranteed to buy the grain from them. We will buy it from them, and that's it. More than happy to, to, to do that. Another part about the, 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 the cereals, and I go back to the comment I made about the variety of rye, which is very important to us, is there is a process out there, which I touched on when I spoke about the different varieties of barley and leading to the homogenization and commoditization of barley. There is an organization that sets out what they call the recommended list and there's a list of varieties. If you grow those varieties, you'll sell those varieties. And I've been making whiskey for 45 years. My opinion on that matter has never, ever, ever been asked. I think, in my mind, it's Apple economics. So I sold you an iPhone 6 the best phone in the world. It will revolutionize your life. Two years later, I have got an iPhone now. See the iPhone 6 I sold you? Oh, forget it, here's. And I think that maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm guilty of making accusations I have not founded on. But why do you keep changing the varieties? Can you not just let me make my own mind up? But with the farmers group, they will grow what we ask, if they want to change the variety, let's manage the process. So it's all part of a market situation. What upset me greatly was our winter variety that we were using, our winter barley variety. And it was on the recommended list. So the farmers were happy. They could use it for feed. They could use it for malt. Somebody somewhere took it off the list. Nobody asked me, didn't ask Scott, do you mind if we take it off the list? They didn't ask us. They took it off the list. So then the farmer stopped growing it. Fortunately, there was another winter variety that we were able to switch to. I'm a customer. Just maybe acknowledge that a little bit. I think that uh, some of that has been lost, I think. And we would like to, in, again, I think it's because we went this way over the 20, 30 years, we need to come this way. And I think we'll engage in that conversation and help to manage that, that situation. Because what's growing in that field there is really important to us. Without that, we don't have whiskey, we don't have the rye law, and it's a really important part of what we do here. And we want to fight provenance, and we want to be able to support that. And we will support it in any way that we can. And there's many ways that we can do that and we're working on that as we speak. And we'll let you know how we progress. It will not be a solution for tomorrow. We're talking years, but that's okay. We're in the whiskey industry. Years is not a problem to us. It's not a problem. That's how we think. We actually think in decades anyway, and this will take time. And we're prepared to let it take its time. And that's what we will do.